Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, this is the LinkedIn Speaker Series. We bring in inspirational people from across the professional world to talk about how they got where they got, how they think about the future, what's coming next, how they uh, ended up navigating their careers, and all kinds of information that will help you and everyone watching. So if you want to see past speaker series, if you want to see this one in the future, uh, you go to speakers.linkedin.com, and you can see all of them. This will be the best one of them all. It'll be the best one today. It's the best one today. <laughs> Mario, thank you for joining us. Thanks Mario Vitali needs no introduction, but I'll give one anyways. Uh, Mario owns restaurants around the world. He is a world-renowned uh, um, chef and restaurateur, considered one of the best in the U.S., has been awarded. The, uh, has been called the best chef in, in, the, in, in Amongst the U.S.? Amongst many things. Yeah. <laughs> And, um, and has inspired so many people who have started their own restaurants or foodies to think about how they want to cook and um, really made a lot of people think about where they're getting their food from, how to source it, and what they're supposed to be doing in the kitchen. So let's talk about how you became you a little bit. Of, you're, you're from Seattle. Born and raised in Seattle. Born and raised in Seattle. And, and your, parents were, your parents were professors. Your mom's a, a nurse and your, your dad's an engineer. My dad was a uh, metallurgist, a metallurgist. metal engineer who treated metals by dipping them into different techniques and different kind of textures to make them stronger to build up Boeing airplanes. He was a Boeing the whole time. Yep. And, and how did you end up, what was your relationship like with food growing up? Well, we grew up in a second generation uh, Italian immigrant family on one side, French Canadian immigrant family on the other. My grandfather father was a hop farmer. Everyone was kind of involved in agriculture in some level. My parents' generation was the first one to go to college. Um, and we just had this relationship with foraging and having food around us at all times. It wasn't Alice Watersy. It wasn't precious. It wasn't uh, anything that needed to be, you know, kind of, sorry. <laughs> It wasn't, uh, it, it wasn't anything that we thought was so unique or special, but we did it all the time, and we, you know, we'd pick blackberries, we'd make our own sausage, we'd do our own pickles, we'd make pies, and that was just kind of what we did. Sitting around in the summer, there'd be an entire army of everybody making Aunt Izzy's you know, antipasto recipe or Aunt uh, Marty's dilly beans. And that was just what we did. That was kind of your required activity, along with doing some yard work and basic gardening. We had food in our lives at all times. And were you always involved with the making the preparation of the food? Were you Everyone a watcher? Was. There was nobody that really? wasn't allowed. You could not not be involved. I mean, right. You had to be a participant. And that was kind of the fun of it. And that was just kind of what you had to do to get to a certain point. Then there were the experts and the moments. My grandfather on my mom's side was the bouillabaisse guy. My grandmother on my Father's side was the one that made the raviolis and made the oxtail ragu and made the gnocchi and all of these kind of crazy dinners. So we just kind of got used to that stuff. But, you know, not every day was a gourmet meal. Like on Monday through Friday, when we were just regular kids, we just basically had, sometimes you just have pasta and a salad. It wasn't like every night was a gourmet meal. So by the time my mom started going back to work, when I was 11, my brother was 10, and my sister was 8, each one of the children had to give her a shopping list at the beginning, uh, at the end of the prior week. And we each had to make dinner one day a week because mom was home at 6 o'clock and dad was home at 6 o'clock. So they would each cook one night and each of the kids would cook one night. Did you do that with your kids? No. <laughs> <laughs> My kids are born into a different level of leisure, I would imagine. No, like, I don't know. It's just like, it's, it, like at this point we work so hard to make sure that our kids have the best opportunity. You never wanted to lay that extra layer of responsibility on them because you're hoping they'll use that time to to work harder on their school stuff. So maybe we were a little too easy on them, mm -hmm. I would say. We just never thought that there was a time that we wouldn't be working on something when did, I was growing up. Did you know, when did you realize that this was not just something you were required to do or something that you liked doing around the house, but it was something you wanted to pursue as a career? Second year in college. When I was applying to colleges, and I, my, my family was lucky enough in 1975 to move to Madrid with Boeing, and I went to high school in Spain. The day Franco died, we got to Spain. And it was an eye-opener to see, first of all, that not everyone loves America, <laughs> which was news in 1975. But we got to see a crazy amount of interesting cultures and delicious food. And we loved to cook, so my mom said, hey, why don't you go to cooking school instead of university? And I had just seen Animal House. And there was absolutely no way I was missing out right. on, <laughs> on what I perceived to be the John Belusification of my possible life. So I'm glad I went to university, but 
then about two years in, I got a job working in a place called Stuff Your Face in New Brunswick, New Jersey, making strombolis. And I fell in love with the idea of working as a collective group toward a common goal that was vanquished in one day, which is what cooking is. Not necessarily owning a restaurant, but cooking on a daily basis. You have to unite with people. Maybe even you don't like them that much, but you work together in a way that you take care of whatever's at hand, and you finish it, and you know that you finished it well. And that was a very satisfying experience, particularly in college when there was always that kind of shoulder chip that I could be studying more right now instead of being at the pub trying to find peyote. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, how did you make the transition then from university to Cordon Bleu? Well, when I graduated college, I did a couple of the job kind of career fairs mm -hmm. and was offered a job to trade currency futures for one of these banks. And it was just like, really? Am I really going to do that? No. So I decided to go back to uh, New Brunswick, and I worked for a year after having applied to the Cordon Bleu in London, I got accepted, but they just make you wait until there's a slot. So it was a year later, and I worked at Stuff Your Face for another year and enjoyed the post-college experience, and then went to move to London and went to the Cordon Bleu. So your parents, must, your mom must have said, I've been telling you to do this for a long time, and now you've... It was never I listening. told you so. It was more uh -huh. like, wow, what a great opportunity. <laughs> right. Like I kind of had perfect parents, probably better than me, than I am. You know? yeah. But that, like, they were just like, great. And they were living in Spain at that time, and then they moved to London, so it was likely and lucky enough for me that I could actually live in their house for a while until I got tired of the rules, because you know the rules are the rules. And yep. So I lived there for a little while, and then I moved out and finished kind of the cooking school thing. About two weeks before it was supposed to be done, I kind of dropped out, which I don't recommend. If you start something, you should finish it. <laughs> and, uh, but I had an opportunity to work for a guy who was at that point not famous, but became subsequently very famous, a guy named Marco Pierre White, who was the guy that taught Gordon Ramsay how to be a douchebag. So <laughs> he, was, he was really, really good at it. Yeah. But he was also the first kind of visionary cook I'd ever worked with, someone who, who took not only just flavor so seriously, but the presentation and the art and the imagination to a 10 times higher level. And so working with him, even though he was abusive, was something that I could learn a lot from. <laughs> And from, from shitty bosses, you can learn just as much about how, what to do and what not to do. So I learned a lot about how not to treat people, but I also learned a lot about how the infinite potential for food to be something merely be, way beyond mere nutrition, which is where the restaurant world was going right then and there. And that's where kind of the transition from food from fuel to food to entertainment as the center stage was starting to happen in America and in Europe at that very time. Oh, before we get into the trends, would you talk a little bit about the... Um, Going from a, a formal education to on-the-job training, you know, you, you didn't finish your formal education. You got close. Two weeks out, you you, you leave. Well, I mean, a cooking school is not necessarily – cooking school is more of a trade school uh -huh. than, say, a formal education. I did finish college with a degree in Spanish theater of the golden age. It was a major <laughs> career. Um, but you're right. There is, there, is, there is formal education in a – environment very much like this room you know it's not really involved in the real thing but you're learning all of the vocabulary you're learning what it is and fundamentally any college education is like that outside of the real hard sciences any kind of liberal arts degree gives you the tools to understand what you might be able to do it's about problem solving it's about uh, solutions to to packages of, of situations and it's about how you collectively move toward getting something done with a group or even solo and you know no one trains you for a job to work even in something as kind of what you would think of straightforward as banking, when you get an economic street, you don't, you don't just go to Wall Street and get a job and they say, go ahead, start banking. You have to go learn it. And what they train you in a liberal arts education is how to apply yourself. And what I always tell people when they go to a liberal arts education is say, listen, you have two things you have to do. You have to become fascinated mm -hmm. and you have to become fascinating. And if you can do that during college, then you've already succeeded. You have to become available to apply all of your information at any chance that you get, but you also have to be able to learn from people and learn how to become a part of the team that is vital. That means you participate when it's necessary, but not always at every second. You don't always have to be the smartest person in the room, but you want to be considered one of the smarter people in the room. When you can do that, then all of a sudden you're working with them, and suddenly you can become someone that's indispensable, which gives you a big opportunity to negotiate your price. <laughs> do you, when you're hiring, do you look for, do you insist on a, do you look for liberal arts education? Do you care about education? How, how I, do you view it? I care a lot about education, but I can tell even without looking at someone's resume within five minutes of an interview whether they're going to work for me or not. And it's just there's an intuition. I can see it in their eyes that they either love this or they're doing it for some other reason. A lot of cooks became cooks in the last 10 years because they wanted to be Emeril Lagasse or Mario Batali, and that is a shitty job. There's not very many, that's like trying to become LeBron. Right. Like there's not that many jobs 
in the, in, in, the, in the top of that echelon, particularly if they want to be in the media. Uh -huh. Like, you have to love being a cook first. And once you do that, then there might be a media opportunity for you to. But if you're just looking to become famous, then I don't need you yet. So, so do, you, do you try to suss? When you're interviewing people, do you try to suss that out pretty quickly? I suss out whether they're passionate about the execution of heat transfer. If they love cooking. That's your question. That's all I Heat need. transfer. I can teach you yeah. how to cook. I, can teach, I can't teach you how to love it. I can teach a chimp how to make linguine with clams, just about the same every day. But I can't teach them to be fascinated by it mm -hmm. and be fascinated even by the constant reproduction of the exact same thing while your mind is escaping that as if during a Zen tea service. You're floating high above the dish while you're still executing it on a daily basis. Your thoughts are free, and you're suddenly at one with so many other things. And then you plate the linguine with clams, and you get on with the fucking ticket because you got to finish it all. Right. <laughs> Fascinating and fascinated. That's right. that is that that's it right both. there. That's right. Uh, all right. So let's go back now to so you, you finish school. You start your when when did you um, when did you realize that you wanted to have your own restaurant? What was that process like? Once you start working for somebody else, you realize immediately that you want to have your own restaurant because mm -hmm. you don't want to take any more shit from anybody. And you really think that you know a lot more than what they know. But yeah. it was like I always thought that I was going to go back. My dad was going to retire from Boeing, and he and I were going to open a little restaurant in Seattle and kind of let that be where we returned. And that was a good idea. And then I got to New York City, and I fell in love with Susie Kahn, who later on became my wife and is still my wife. 23 years, seven months, and 14 days. And, um, and I love New York City, so I decided to stay here. My dad came after he retired from Boeing, came out here, wanted to open another little, decided he still wanted to open a restaurant in Seattle, came out here, did the Peter Kump Cooking School, uh, did an internship at a place called Alps, which is a salami factory over in Queens, and then came to work for me for two weeks at Poe, which sadly last night closed for it was Sorry, my yeah. very first restaurant in 1993. I left it in 2000. My partner was still there. But he saw how hard it was even to operate a 34C restaurant, which is about half the whole, the whole restaurant, including upstairs and downstairs, back in front of the house, is as big as this room. Crazy. And he saw how much hard work that was, so he decided he wanted to go into the salami business, which is a little bit more calculated and not necessarily so much in a hurry. And he fell in love with that aspect of the food. And in, in, in the food business, there's thousands and thousands of ways to do it, whether you're in the farming or whether you're in the distribution or whether you're in the foraging or whether you're in the final product or whether you're making plates or whether you're distilling grapes into, into brandy or whether you're pressing wine or making cider or making, you know, there's a thousand ways to be in the food industry in addition to also writing about it and being a scribe or being a journalist. And there's a thousand ways to go at it. So it's a very rich field right now. But what's... I'm just driving this thing crazy, aren't I? It's all right. Don't worry. Audio guy doing a good job. Um, so the idea, of course, is eventually you want to own your destiny. Uh -huh. And that was owning my own restaurant for me. So when I kind of about the beginning of working for Marco Pierre White, I realized, well, I'm certainly going to take shit right now, but I don't want to take shit for the rest of my life. So I'm eventually going to want to open my own restaurant. And that's what kind of led me to New York. I worked in a, in a private yacht business a little bit in Bodrum in Turkey for some time. And I worked at a bunch of fancy restaurants in France. And then I worked in California and San Francisco and in Santa Barbara. And then worked in a tiny little restaurant in Italy for about a year and a half, two years. And I came back on my way to go to visit some friends in Brazil. And I stopped in Florida and ran into an old college roommate of mine. And we decided to come up here and take over Rocco, which is now Carbone. And we did that for about a year, and then I didn't realize I didn't get along with that partner, and I went to work at Cafe Tabac, which at that point was where all the super bottles used to spray each other down with water. I don't know what it was, but <laughs> then I found this lease, and we opened Poe, yeah. and that was in 1993. And you opened that with Joe? No, that was with Steve Crane. I opened the Bobo with Bobo Joe. Bobo was with that Joe. That was our first restaurant with Joe, and since then, we've opened 28 restaurants, four grocery stores, and at this point, we have 4,400 employees. That's incredible. Let's, let's wasn't what we planned. You've been working with uh, Joe uh, for that long. It's, it's unusual to see a partnership last that long through ups and downs, recessions, uh, growth periods. What's the secret to, to being able to work with someone for? Um, you have to be able to trust your partner to do the things that you either don't want to do or aren't confident that you can do. Eventually, you become both quite confident that you can do all of the jobs. Mm -hmm. But it's nice to have someone who you can bounce your different opinions off of and whose opinion you trust when you think you might be making either a good one or a bad one or whether it's ubris or fear that is driving your decisions that you can use it as a sounding board. So we've 
collectively made all of our restaurants as much about each of us as it is about ourselves. How do you split the world? Well, it used to be that I was in the kitchen and he was in the front of the house. And that's kind of the easiest way to do it, you know, basically. I did all the cooking, and he kind of ran the front of the house and did the wine list. You know, as we've gotten more mature and maybe a little lazy or a little bit more drawn toward the upper level management of helping people understand their great gifts, it's been more that we're managing people than we're managing the specifics of any restaurant. Although anybody that changes any restaurant item menu in my group, which is 26 restaurants, the chefs email me just about every day, and I approve and debate and dispute or discuss everything that happens in all the kitchens because make, they've and all worked Any change to a menu has to go through you. Yes. Wow. Um, but I mean, they're intuitive. Like, they've all worked with me. Like, right. the reason we opened restaurants wasn't that we took a dart and threw at a board and said, oh, let's go to Las Vegas. It was more that we had really good people. Like, the first reason we opened our second restaurant, which was Lupa, was because Mark Ladner, who was the sous chef, the opening sous chef at Babo under Andy Nesser, he was so good that uh, clearly, after about a year and a half or two years, he had, he had exceeded what the sous chef job was. He was better than that job needed him to be. And he was going to go work for somebody else hmm. because someone else was going to make him a head chef. So we defensively built Lupa so that he could be a partner in it and have his own piece of equity. And we wouldn't lose him to Danny Meyer or Drew Nipperant or any one of the other restaurateurs around town. And each of our restaurants has basically become that. For Zach Allen, who was Mark's sous chef at Lupa, we opened Oto. And for Casamono, it was because Andy, who uh, was at the original, the original chef of uh, Babo, he became you know, too good for that, and he wanted to have his own access. And each of the restaurants that we have, including Osteria Moza in Los Angeles with Nancy Silverton, she wasn't from within our group, but she was a dear old friend of ours who had a divorce with her husband, and they kind of gave up on Campanile, and she needed a project. And we said, well, we'll love to work with you. And Zach wanted to move to Vegas, so we took Zach out of Oto and moved to Vegas and opened four restaurants with him. And now we have Nicole Brisson, who's been with Zach all this whole time. So each time, each one of these places has organically built itself. It's not like we just decided, all right, let's hire an HR department, let's put an ad in the paper and see if we can hire an executive chef and a, par and, and, and a general manager. No, but it's so different than you know, what you might hear in business school. Find a market that, where there's a market need. Uh, figure out the total addressable market you're going after, put a restaurant in. You know, it, it is a top-down. You're, you're really betting on people. You find someone, you think they're good, and then you're opening a restaurant around them. And believe me, that is a better way. Huh. Because fundamentally what makes a, a shop, a store, a dish, a single garnish better than something else is a human hand. It's all about the human touch for us. Now, that's not maybe the same in making Porsches or widgets or toothbrushes or whatever else you happen to make in whatever market you have to be in. But food is such a personal expression of, of the individual karma of each individual that's involved in it and the hands that have to make it. This is a truly hands, human hand business. So you, it has to be based on the humans that are in the, the story. There isn't, there isn't a real replicable story that I feel confident telling, which is why after building 28 restaurants, I don't have something to sell to Olive Garden. Had I built 28 of the same thing, Olive Garden would buy it, right. and, and they would say, great, we're going into the upscale mid-market $28 check average restaurant, or whatever they'd say yeah. that they wanted. We don't really have that to sell. So if we were looking for a giant golden parachute or a way out of this business, we would have built maybe two or three concepts and then moved them forward and then sold them as a group to somebody who wanted to blow them out as a private equity firm. That wasn't our goal. So my goal now, and Joe and I have been thinking about it, and we totally disagree. But my goal is to give the restaurants to the people who have successfully moved to the top of them and operated them and let them operate them as they will and give us a royalty for a certain amount of time. And then the only way they can give it up, they can't sell it. They have to give it to the next generation. If they can't give it to the next generation, they have to give it back to me. Hmm. Now, keep in mind, I own a lot of the real estate. I won't give that to them. But I'll give them the brand and the building and the, and, and the opportunity to extend themselves and to make them part of that. This is, this is not what they teach you at business school. Yeah. <laughs> Do you, uh, it, it, operating like that means you never worry about competition. You're not, it doesn't sound like you ever think, well, we can't go in there because there's already a fine Italian, there's already a restaurant, Italian restaurant that people love, or this kind of restaurant that they, you, you, are you confident that no matter where you go in with the right people, you can run a very successful restaurant and business? Yes, I am. <laughs> Actually, the only place I won't go into business right now is in Seattle because my sister has that restaurant that they opened with my dad, and I, can't, I couldn't stand getting them to kick my ass. It would feel awful. 
But no, I mean, like, what the, the, I don't go in there with a, um, as a foreigner. Like, every time we go to a new market, it's because someone in our group wants to go live there. So they're basically going home. They're going back to where they came from. Of course, they came to New York to find their Broadway or whatever they came to do, or they're going to Vegas because they're going to sow their wild oats, and then eventually they're going to go back to wherever their town is. But our, 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 our partners are headed back to their homes. Mm -hmm. They're going back to live where they think they deserve to be or that they've always thought they were going to be. Not that they're striking out and let's, well, there's a marginal revenue curve that you can find in Duluth and it's better than the one in Dubuque and I'm pretty sure that, that you know, that's just yeah. not the way we think. And we were talking before, you, you run a very small, you have a lot of employees, but the management of, your, of the operation is very small. How many people are, are would you say, running Batali World? Well, we have an office with about... 75 people, that is human resources, payables, receivables. And then my team is basically six. And then there's a CEO, a CFO, and then there's all the operators. Mm -hmm. In each location, there's a general manager, a wine director, and a, and a chef, and then a pastry chef. And it, every now and then, it gets a little upside down because either the people in the office or the chef and general manager contingent suddenly misperceived the balance of power. The, the office is there to facilitate and make the day easier for the operations. It's never that the office will direct the operations, which is also counterintuitive right. to a corporate structure because the people that are making the money and doing the actual hands-on work on a daily basis and actually dealing with the customer and finding the variations and things that we may need to adjust, change, or completely shit can, they're on the field. And the office is there to kind of make sure that the payables are done and that human resources is right and that the insurance has all been done and all the claims get through. They're helping us do all the things, but they're not on the field and they are definitely not directing the operations. And every now and then we'll get a zealous person in the office field who thinks, I'm going to be the director of this. And you're like, no, 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 no. You go help them right now. And if there was a broken mirror in the bathroom, you go to the hardware store and you help them get it because they're busy dealing with customers. Right. Um, what's a typical day like for you? How do you, how do you organize yourself? <laughs> you looking for Pam? Pam Lewis yeah. right there. <laughs> um, I get up about five, just about every day of my life. I uh, box or I play golf. Then I meditate. Meditation, if you don't do it, I recommend it. Huh. It's a way to find a calm little moment of you making sure that every stupid thing that happens to you every day doesn't piss you off. I'm the kind of guy that stupid shit used to piss me off. And it's also in the variation of human behavior or even the repetition of foolish behavior by the same person. And what you do is if you can find a way to calm that little general anger down, you're a far more effective manager because you don't ever come back at it with passion and anger. You come back at it with like, let's do this, let's look over this one more time. And it gives you a chance to pause and not so emotionally react to things. So every day you meditate? Every day. Twice a day. Twice a 20 day? 20 minutes twice a day. What, do you do it anywhere? Do you have a special place for it? Um, yeah. I mean, uh, a chair. Uh -huh. Any chair will do. I <laughs> <laughs> a beach chair works. Yeah. I mean, you know. But like when, when I'm shooting the chew, it's after rehearsal before we do the show. Mm -hmm. Uh, and when I'm at home in New York, it, uh, before dinner, I sit down and I find a half hour. And everyone's told, and you tell everyone, you know, don't bother me during yeah, this time. Yeah, they kind of can tell because I'm like at my office and the, the lights are off. Got it. Right. But, you know, whatever. You can do it out on the beach. You can do it anywhere. It doesn't have to be some sacred place. You don't have to have someone dinging some bell right. or whatever. <laughs> it's just calm. And yeah. they, I do that in the morning. And then uh, basically I get on with my day. If I'm shooting the chew, we're busy until about 1.30. Uh, if I'm not doing the chew, then I kind of feel like I'm free. I can do whatever I want. But, like, you know... You, you, I fill up my day with the assistance of Pam Louie, who's the director of communication, sitting right there. And we find things that are, are intriguing to what we think our agenda is, which is to uh, spread our joy and our passion about both the restaurant and food and wine business, as well as technique and sharing the information, our love for Italian and other cultures, uh, the idea of sharing information and kind of figuring out what social media means in our hands and how we can attract people or appease them or entertain them or educate them in mm -hmm. ways that make it uh, our brand more recognized as something that they want us to. They want to be a part of. Well, it's so much more external than what it used to be. You have you, you are out there educating people versus running running the, the particular restaurant. Well, you're doing both. I mean, keep in mind, back in 1979, when you became a cook, 
it was usually the last thing you did after you got out of the military before you went to jail. <laughs> like it was the lowest common profession. Yeah. Now becoming a cook is kind of a groovy thing. So there's already kind of a field out there, but there's a lot of cooks out there who toil under the idea that their only goal is to be on Top Chef or to be on Bravo or to be Iron Chef or to be a winner in some competition. The, the field is really as much about cooking and finding customers as it is cooking and finding pleasure. And you know, being happy at your job is a lot more significant than merely being successful at it for bumps and rides at a time. And mm -hmm. so I would always suggest to anybody, if you can find something you love to do, you're never at work. So my kids look at me and they see, I'm happy all the time, like stupid happy. And they're looking at me like, Dad, maybe I should get a job like yours. Four years ago they said, if we got into your business, Dad, we would consider ourselves failures. Because they thought that living in my shadow would have been that they were holding on to it. Now maybe they're going to think a little bit different of it as they go through college. But as I say to them, if you can find it, whatever it is, whether it's archaeology or whether it's driving a taxi or whether it's painting houses or nuclear physics, whatever you want to do, find something that you love. And you will be so excited by it every day that you never feel like you're looking at your clock thinking, oh, man, another hour I can go home. It's more like, fuck, I should have gone home two hours ago. I'm still here. Right. And that's an ideal position to be in. Um, how, how do you think about, when, when did you first realize that you had crossed over from being a chef or restaurateur to being a celebrity, you know, a celebrity <laughs> chef, celebrity restaurateur, getting that adjective before everything? And, and how has that changed how you live? Or I remember when I first got on the Food Network in 1994, and I had Poe, and I had a, a very funny, very educated, snarky, funny waiter named Mike Masai. And one of his big comments, because my show was on at that time on the Food Network at noon, which, Good time. which was a different time <laughs> than it is now. Because now you watch TV whenever you want. Back then, when noon was noon, that was when you got to watch the show. So the, the joke was that anyone under four or over 90 came in, and they were, hey, Molto, your fans are in. Let's go check them out. And uh, it was the, like, within a month of being on TV, I, I noticed a lot of people were saying, hey, you're Mario Vitale from the Food Network. And it was just... It was odd. It wasn't uh, disconcerting. I felt really good. I was living in Greenwich Village, and that was just like a lot of people in the village already recognized me because I was buying their bread or I was buying the meat from the butcher shop. And all of a sudden, you'd see tourists and people coming from out of town recognizing you or making the pilgrimage to come to my restaurant, which was a nice touch. And it helped the restaurants be busy. I mean, the restaurant be busy, and it was a nice touch. So I guess in 1995, I was a little famous, and then it just kind of keep, keeps growing. It's a different thing. Does it affect how you, does it affect your restaurants? Does it have an impact on, on your restaurants? Does that, does that enable you to open things that, and know that they'll instantly be hits? A little bit. A little bit. <laughs> no, what it does is it gives you a soapbox, and it means that people automatically already recognize what you stand for. If you are a chef and you left your town in Dubuque mm -hmm. and you went to New Orleans, a great restaurant town, very busy, lots of stuff going on, and you opened your restaurant and no one knew who you were, it would be hard to convince a lot of people very quickly to come to your restaurant and fill it up. At this point, with the breathless internet food community, like they start doing this behind the plywood stuff six months before you're open. They're talking about what you might be doing. Right. So there's a market out there for people that have already opened one restaurant. Having the media out there helps that. But if you're completely unknown, you've got to work hard to get that first one in. The best way to do that work is to make sure that your food is delicious and your statement is consistent with your ideology and your execution is consistent with your statement. And when you can do all that and you have a point of view that is somewhat unique, not even completely unique because we're still serving cooked protein and vegetables or raw, <laughs> and you're putting it on a plate and you're serving it for whatever. Come, people come in, they give you their coat, they sit down, they order some food, you give it to them, they stand up, they leave, you give five bucks, you give them back your coat, and they leave. Like That's the experience, right? <laughs> if, if they can remember it for some reason that it was unique, delicious, remarkable, thought-provoking, or otherwise satisfying, they'll tell two people. If it was a shitty experience, they'll tell 20 people. Mm -hmm. So you have to make sure that your experience is consistently rewarding to the people that you're trying to approach or reach. And that's just about kind of settling into some kind of a model of hospitality. And it's making people feel good about having chosen to come into your restaurant, gastronomically, spiritually, 
auditorially and that some people really like hearing the music at yeah. our restaurants, but a lot of people think that I'm an asshole for playing loud music at a certain point in the afternoon. It's just like, this is what we do. Like, right. We curate it, we think about it. It's not like it happens happenstance. Like, we think about how comfortable the chairs are and what level the lights are on and what kind of music there is and how loud it's played and at what time it's played and how we open and when we open and where we feel about it. Like We manage all of these details before we get open and then the trick is to make sure that you operate it on that same level every day because if you go back to a restaurant, the calamari that you ordered three weeks ago isn't the same or it's worse or it's saltier, it's harder, it's softer, it's more caramelized, it's less caramelized, whatever. If it's an inconsistent experience, then, then people will recognize that and they'll say, well, I'm not going back there because it wasn't as good the second time. A lot of things that are happening right now in the restaurant business is a lot of these restaurants are one tasting menu. They'll mm -hmm. have like nine courses and it changes every day, which is not necessarily what the original restaurant experience was, basically because it's not consistent. It, effectively, it's a dinner party. But those are the ones that are getting the Michelin stars right now because that kind of experience can be so curated that if you buy into the chef's style, then you're loving it. Like, What's your take uh, on that? Do you think this is a good uh, Well, in, in the case of going to a place like Blanca huh? behind Roberta's, it's fantastic. Like, all of the food I recognize as food. It's cooked by people that I can see right there. They're happy and joyous. They have a turntable with music that I can help choose sometimes. And it's a fantastic experience. Roberta's just across the, you know, the little sidewalk there, run by the same people. Killer pizzas, boisterous, loud, raucous experience. Really good, delicious food, fundamentally, all because their chef, Carlo Maracchi, is a really visionary guy. There are other places that enjoy that same kind of fame that necessarily by their own decision to make food that you don't recognize and isn't even that tasty. Like there's a lot of things that are more about the provocation of your intellect right. as opposed to the satisfaction of your palate and your delicious gustatorial pleasure. It's more that they're just provoking you and they're, and they're very intellectual and there's a lot of restaurants on that top 50 list by the San Pellegrino Awards every year that are like, well, I don't really want to go there. It doesn't diminish their importance. It just means that's that kind of experience. I'd rather eat at a classic osteria in Modena than the fanciest restaurant in Italy just about 99 times out of 100 because I'm much more of that kind of experience. I like the old style and the tradition. I like also recognize those products and I recognize the way that they taste and I like them, even if they're treated differently. So you kind of have to decide where you want to be on mm -hmm. that. And there's different levels for us. Like Mark Ladner, up until about a month ago, had been at Del Posto since the start. And Del Posto was an entirely mm -hmm. different experience than Lupa. Both great things, both exactly what they're supposed to be, but entirely different price points, entirely different comfort levels, entirely different levels of luxury, and both the complete mm -hmm. desire of the operators in each of those locations. Like, they are exactly what they want them to be. But running through all of your restaurants, this, uh, the idea of locally sourced food is something that's consistent across every, well, yeah. every restaurant, right? right. And, and you have... You Freshness is a, is a vital piece of deliciousness. Yeah. Anything that's been out of the ground for a long time just slowly fades away. I mean, it, it, it's just... It's, it's a very slow level of rot. But do you find that uh, as, as, the tra as people have picked up... You were very early to this. You were, you were a believer and, and, and a proselytizer and, and the need to have very fresh, very local... Food as other as that's become almost commonplace. Are you finding it harder to source ingredients? How do you think? How do you? What's your supply chain like? Does it change depending on where you go in the world? It does. It changes a lot. But I mean, keep in mind, I've been in New York and talking to the people that bring food and produce to the Union Square Green Market, one of the fundamental hearts and souls of a lot of the restaurants around here. I know those people for yeah. twenty five years, so they save us. Like we call them. We don't even have to get up early anymore. We call them and tell us to save Rick's Picks Those Berries or Franca's Berry Treasure. We get first choice of the raspberries just because we've been here the longest. Mm -hmm. So we have access to that. And when new products come in or when there's new market fish, like, then you just got to be the first one. But keep in mind, we've been paying our accounts solid for 20, 25 years. So everyone recognizes us when we walk into the market, whether it's the fish market or whether I call Pat Lafrida and say, listen, I need something, Pat. Like, I've got a long track record of successful business and never beating anybody. You know, that's a big piece of the business. And a lot of the young upstarts don't really understand the value of constantly paying all your bills. What do you mean, no, not beating anyone? You mean not stringing them out? No, yeah, by paying people, like, right. you know, whether it's 10 days or 30 days or 45 days. We pay everybody on time. Got it. Because that's a very strong relationship building device. And outside the U.S.? Outside where you're not as well known? You might not have those, that history? What do you do? You, you, you show up and you do it. You mm -hmm. start doing it. In Singapore, we're really successful because, you know, we spend a lot of time on the ground there and we've cultivated a lot of the interesting stuff. 
and a lot of the local purveyors, but we've also got really good relationships with the people that import the stuff. If you want to make really good you know, spaghetti sauce, you have to bring San Marzano tomatoes in no matter what. We have dilly-dallied with the idea that we're going to grow tomatoes either in China or in um, Singapore or somewhere in Southeast Asia, and we just haven't really met the we haven't really created the demand. If we were going to build six or seven more restaurants there, it might be that we would introduce Italian-style tomato and mozzarella production there so that we could actually own it and be a part of it. Hmm. Um, we're going to open this up to questions in a few minutes. So if you've got them, start thinking about them. We'll, we'll, we have microphones, and we've got a stream, I believe, right? And we have a stream somewhere? All right. Um, so start thinking about what you want to ask. The, I'd love to know, you talked a little bit about what's next, this idea of potentially handing off the restaurants. Right. Is that, what, is that going to happen, or is that just a kind of idea you're No, you're it's starting now? to percolate now. Mm -hmm. I'm still loving every day that I get to go to work and be a part of what I'm doing, but maybe in five or ten years it'll be different. I, I, don't, I don't imagine I will ever retire, though, because I like what I do. Yeah. So maybe if I divested myself of all of the restaurants that I'm participating in right now, I would probably still want to buy, like, a finca north of Barcelona and work maybe... June, July, and August, and have my restaurant only open on Saturday and Sunday and serve like giant antipasto, and then you come by and order either the fish or the protein meat by the pound, and I just grill it and saute it. You, you know, you do like, you know, 800 covers two days a week and then close, and then close in September 1 and come back to work in Jul June 1. Right. Like, that would be fun. It would be exciting. It could be profitable. It's kind of a dream for a lot of people to be able to eat that way. And it would be exciting to still stay in the food business and enjoy it. Do you want to keep, do you, do you see yourself uh, always being a large employer? Is that something, do you like the, the, the process of hiring huge numbers of people, bringing people in, waiters and servers and, you know, this? The, the, the first step is always the hardest one. But once you have people that you can develop a relationship with and you can impart whatever you want from them, and it's not even that that I'm imparting from them. I'm learning from them uh -huh. more significantly. And we can develop a two-way conversation and a two-way piece of, of, of improving whatever we're doing. That's kind of a really exciting part and an interesting part of staying uh, valid, valid and, and, and interested in what you're doing. And as we move forward with Italy, you know, each time we open in Italy, we have six to 800 employees, and we're opening three Italys in 18 months. So we have, you know, 1,800 or 2,000 more people coming on pretty quickly. How do, you, how do you onboard that many people? And who are you competing with for talent? IBM. No, I mean, you're competing with everybody because yeah. it's not necessarily the food space. Like, you know, right. every, everybody would be very interested in working with a vibrant, growing company whose philosophy is about biodiversity and doing the world right. Yeah. Whether it's, you know, whether you're making Nikes or Porsches or, or spaghetti sauce, you know, like it's, we're competing with everybody at this point, but we have the kind of cachet that it's a little sexier to work in the food space. And you feel like you might be a little closer to doing the right thing for the world if you're working for the food space. So that's our next platform is to present Italy as a place where you come to work, not because you just want to be a cook, but because you want to do the planet one better. Right. And that's kind of our ideology. And if you're familiar with the slow food movement and Carlo Petrini's writings, that's kind of our Bible. Mm -hmm. So that gives us an opportunity to take people from a wide swath of, of different varieties of thought processes and educational levels and put them into a place where they can be very happy putting the carrots on the counter because it's not just putting the carrots on the counter. It's, it's purveying the entire message of what goodness can be, and that's kind of what our ideology can be and should be. That's great. All right, let's open it up to some questions. Uh, we've got one right here. Go ahead. Hello. Thank you, Dan. Hello, Mario. My name is Ari Ken. Obviously, you're in the New York office. So you just spoke about contributing to the world, these people coming together. How does potentially an upstart or a social enterprise partake and partner with you in expanding that global mission? You mean how do you come work for me or how do we work Yeah, together? I have somebody for you. I have some, some things I was going to talk to you about. And so... Well, you come and find me. I'm, okay. uh, if you've ever been to Oto, my office is the last three seats at the bar by the kitchen door. Okay. And I'm pretty much there five days a week. And I'm not real standoffish unless you show up and ask for a selfie before introducing yourself. No, no selfies. <laughs> okay. So cool. come meet me there. Okay. Thank you. I'm available. All right. I have some people for you. All right. Thank you. You can also just talk to Pam Louie right there. Raise your hand, Pam. Raise your hand, Pam. All right. <laughs> So I have a couple yes, questions. Yes, you with the orange shirt. You know, on theme. 
<laughs> by the way, um, Rochelle, I just want to thank Rochelle, by the way, for providing me with these uh, Mario Vitale orange uh, shoes and for putting this all on, of course. Did yeah. you guys all see the shoes that Dan has? Can we get a close-up on the shoes? I don't know if it's possible here. All right, these Look, hold on. Yeah. They're so new. Do you like that? I, forgot to. I was going to return oh, them. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> I was going to return them. It's, I noticed it's, that a, it's also that hip hop kids don't take the sticker off the bottom yeah, side right. of the brim of their hat. It's cool thought, to leave it on. I thought maybe that was your angle. <laughs> it's a better one. Sorry, Rochelle. Go no, ahead. No, it's great. Um, okay, so a question came in on the stream. Applause to your foundation for making food access more equitable, equitable in Boston. Consider oh, something else just popped in. Sorry. <laughs> Consider investing and partnering with startups solving food problems at scale. Have you considered that? Yes. Um, I started a foundation about eight years ago called the Mario Vitale Foundation, I realized about a decade ago that people would come and ask the local restaurateur, the successful restaurateur, anywhere that they went, they'd ask for some kind of a donation. And I was giving out donations basically on the, to good customers. You know, people would say, well, you know what, I've got this. Can you help me with this? Uh, can you donate a dinner or sign books or whatever, blah, blah, blah. And at the end of the day, I realized that at that point, I was probably giving away stuff that raised about three or $400,000 a year, but that there was no focus. There was no strategy to my giving. And I realized, well, let me think about this. What's important to me? And for me, what's important is giving everyone really good opportunity, mostly children. So I fundamentally work on children's hunger relief, children's disease research, and children's literacy guarantee. So we build libraries. We work with the food bank, and we work with, sorry about this. Uh, we work with food bank, and we work with orphan diseases. It's not, it's not diseases of orphans. It's small, unfunded, relatively um, not uh, large constituency diseases that children have, basically because my friends' kids get stuck with something. And they come to me and say, listen, there's not any research on neuroblastoma. And uh, my friend Liam, uh, a little guy, died five and a half years ago. And it was just like, what could we ever do? And it's just like $50,000 is, is a thousand times more than they ever had in neuroblastoma research. So we give small grants like that to get things rolling and get things started. And all of a sudden, Cookies for Kids Cancer raised like $7 million last year. And, and that's their fundamental goal. So me participating with them makes me feel really good. I'm never going to be Michael J. Fox with $700 million in Parkinson's. But like, it, it just feels good. So my foundation raises about a million, a million, two a year. And we give it out to things like that. And it makes my team feel that we're participating participating in things. We aren't necessarily curing anything at all, except that we've built 16 libraries in three and a half years. And we're helping little bits of things that do anything. But I would never let my foundation become the biggest thing. Like, we're still in business. And the foundation is a cool way for my teams to be able to play in a field where they can give their time to something that is relevant to us as a collective group. So yes, I would definitely entertain that idea. All you have to do is send something to, oh, that's right, Pam Louie. <laughs> Questions. I have a couple more from the stream, but here, come on up. You don't need a mic, just talk. <laughs> oh, so the stream can We're streaming oh, okay. across sorry, the world, sorry. so yeah. Streaming, <laughs> streaming. Hi, Dan, and hi, Mario. Hi. Thanks for coming to LinkedIn. Uh, so you spoke a lot about how you think through all of the details prior to opening up a new restaurant, and I was recently reading about the new restaurant Manzo that you opened up in Flatiron, Italy, and it mentioned how you have a vermouth-focused bar. So I wanted to know what was the thought process behind that? So Manzo is basically the retweak of the original beef style steak restaurant that was across the street from the across the street, across the aisle from the fish and behind the butcher counter. And we decided to make it a little lighter, a little less kind of fancy tablecloth you sit down, and we decided to make it a little more open and feel a little bit less like you had to sit down and have a four-course meal or a three-course meal. In doing that, we made the bar a little bit bigger, and we decided to have an angle on cocktails. And I love cocktails, but my problem with cocktails in New York particularly is that you order a martini or a Negroni, and it is six ounces of liquor, and you have two of those, and you're fucking shit-faced. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's it, like of course you order two because you've been there for 45 minutes, but they're, they're just so big and so strong. The original Italy... Um, invented by Oscar Farinetti, is in the Carpano factory, which is across from the Fiat factory in Torino. Carpano Punte Mace is one of the original vermouths. So we thought, well, what would be a better testament to the origination of the idea of Italy than to go back and understand what vermouths? And vermouths are kind of a tisane or a, or a tea or an infusion of herbs mixed with a wine. 
So they're not much stronger than a wine or about as strong as a wine. And they have all of these incredible flavors, often soaked with wood or herbs or aromatics or any other kinds of things. So you have a vermouth or, or you have a vermouth and a Campari or something like a Milano Torino, which is Punte Mes and Campari, one from each town. And you mix that with soda water and you have this cocktail that is refreshing and an appetizing and it opens your palate and it gets you excited, but it doesn't get you hammered so you don't remember dessert. And that is a big part of what a good restaurant can be. You can enjoy two or three different kind of cocktails without having to pay for it at the end of the meal by not even knowing how you got home. It's the anti-blackout story. I can't wait to try it. All right. How do you make that decision to reformulate the restaurant? You said that... In a grocery store like Italy, it's just you have to change things every, more often than you would say a baba. Like a baba will refresh, but we don't want to reinvent baba. We just want it to feel like it's consistent and clean and like we'll replace the sconces this year. And it's, it's a six month situation because we can't get the exact ones. So as opposed to just getting a new one, we, I want to make sure that it's just one that has a story that tells me what a sconce means and why we would go from one sconce to another. Because if you don't, all of a sudden you just have something that looks like a flea market. So every time you change something a little bit, it has to be consistent with what you want. Or you completely revamp it like we did at Italy. So every five or six years, we'll revamp a lot of the things. And at Italy, if you've noticed, like every year, it, the, the birreria was for the first four years the birreria. Now in the winter, it's kind of this alpine thing. Mm -hmm. And in the summer, it's kind of this beachy thing. And giving that an opportunity to change also gives it a chance to reinvent itself for the press component and for consumers to come up and say, oh, yeah, they just changed back to what I liked last year more than I liked over the winter. It gives it a breath of fresh air. Do you do it based on gut, or are there numbers you're looking at to no, make those decisions? No, gut and just what, what excites us. Uh -huh. uh, us as the group of people that operate Italy. There's uh, Adam and Alex Saper, our, our American-based partners, along with the Fadi Neti family. <laughs> And they're vital in deciding and helping us kind of figure out exactly what we're going to do collectively. Yes. Hi, Mario. Hi. My name is Amy. And um, this could be a loaded question because I know you love every aspect of cooking and, and what you create in all of your dishes. But I would love to know if you have one or a couple of favorite dishes that you create right now. That I cook or that you cook? That you. I cook. <laughs> I am consistently happy about any kind of a thin, dried pasta noodle with shellfish. So for me, linguine with clams, black spaghetti with rock shrimp and chorizo that we do at, the, at Babo, uh, the spaghetti with jalapenos and Dungeness crab that we do at Del Posto. Those are the things that, to me, sing the song the most of the product and the least of the chef. As you begin older and older and older, you less need chef intervention and are more impressed by the simplicity of the product and the product's uniqueness itself. So that's what makes me the happiest. That said, like a duck egg with a little Parmigiano Reggiano on it and the seasonal black truffles that are going to come in this Thursday and Friday are <laughs> going to make me very happy too because it's a great duck egg. I get it at the Green Market. The truffles in the parm. Sorry. <laughs> Hey, Lou, I'll call you back in two minutes. <laughs> it's my son. <laughs> so that's it. Those are the things. But it's less about the chef, and it's much more about the product. Yes. Sounds delicious. Yes. Thanks again for coming, as everyone's already said. Um, my question is a little bit about how we've talked through how you feel about the congruencies or not congruencies of your business philosophy when you're going to market with a new restaurant. Um, wanted to know what you thought of Danny Meyer getting credited with taking tipping out of restaurants, and I don't know what your philosophy is on that type of business decision, but I know that really shook up a lot of the restaurant world from a consumer perspective. I don't know if credit is the proper word to give to Danny Meyer about the tipping because they've changed two back. The New York consumer is a picky one, and uh, your age group and the group just below you in age is probably ready to look at that. The people uh, just below my age and my age and above do not know what to make of it. And when you go to a restaurant that has always had entrees in the 20 to $30 range, and all of a sudden they're like Pasquale Jones, where uh, pizza is 34 bucks and the pork shank is 50 bucks, it's very hard to get your eye wrapped around that, even though it's tip included, because you're just like, what the fuck? There's not a 75, there's not a bottle of wine under 75 bucks on this list. And it is, it's, whether it's inevitable 
or whether it is now or whether it's the future. The tipping culture in America is something that is a lot older than the idea that we're going to change it in the next two or three years. I appreciate why Danny's doing it, and it makes a lot of sense to equitably distribute all of the restaurant's resources to all of the staff members. But keep in mind, you know, at a restaurant like Babo or Del Posto, waiters who can work four days or five days a week can make $140,000 or $130,000. There is no cook who will make that. And to redistribute that right now in the middle of a time when the minimum wage is going to go to $15, which means the waiters are all going to make $15, even if they're tipped, is a, is a hard thing for us to figure out. We're, we don't have the answer. We are more really worried about the sustainability of the operation. So we're just trying to figure out what it's going to be. And it's basically a blinking game. No blink right now. Everyone's looking at everybody, <laughs> waiting for some really smart person to come up with the answer. But we have not figured it out. So we are, at this point, paying waiters that we used to pay $5 an hour, $12 an hour, and we're still holding the ground and allowing the tips to be distributed as it is, because we just can't figure out how to take that away. So to Danny Meyer's credit, it's probably working in some places. I don't think it's working in all of them, and it'll be interesting to see. I would say that in the next two years, because of the increased costs and because of the fear of the present administration in our United States government, in New York City, you will see 15 to 20 percent of the restaurants here close because they just won't make it because the costs are going up, the competition is stiff, and the rents are going up too, and it's just going to squeeze the margin down to nothing. You know, where you used to be able to do 15 to 25 percent margin in the restaurant business, at this point, a lot of operations are 5 to 15, and if you raise those costs another 10 percent, you're in the minus 5 to plus 5, which is no longer worth being operating. And you'll see great restaurant tours that you've known for a long time closing up shop and going either somewhere else or going into another field because it is times are very tough if you are going to blink. If you don't have the assets to kind of wait this out and see what happens, and the team that's got the passion to kind of wait and figure it out, then it's, you're going to close. There's going to be a lot of closing. Poe, as I said, closed last night. So what do you tell young restaurateurs who come to you? Do you recommend they get into the business? Do you steer people away if from this industry? If you love what you do, uh -huh. you will find a way to be happy and, a, and it'll be sustainable. It may not be the traditional model. At this point, we're trying to explore a place, uh, like the model would be like a barbecue place where there's three or four chefs, they cook all the stuff at once, and then they just chop it. The people wait up like at, say, a uh, hometown barbecue. Right. All the cooks are, there's only four cooks, and there's really only two or three waiters who are bringing this stuff out. You've taken all of those $15 an hour employees. For a restaurant that big, there would have been 100, and now there's eight. And if you can cook enough food and make it delicious enough and interesting enough and put it in an environment that's still fun and exciting, you're, gonna, you're not going to get your fine dining customer there on Friday night going out for their 30th anniversary, but you might get a whole mess of, you might get this whole room right here any Saturday or any Thursday for dinner, and that is a valid trade-off, and that might be where the future is. It'll certainly be less uh, hourly operators, hourly workers in every location is the only way this is going to work in the long run, provided the new structure. Great. Thank you. I have a couple of popular questions that are coming in on the stream. A lot of people are voting on them for, for me to ask. So um, one is, when can we expect an Italy location in San Francisco? I'll tell you. My wife. <laughs> <laughs> she knows where I am. <laughs> um, San Francisco for me is a very tricky place. I have exactly one location in mind, and it would be all of Ghirardelli Square. And they're not giving it to me right now. <laughs> but if they did, I would take the whole master lease. I would put Italy on the whole ground floor. I would rent the second floor area to Italian couture, design, furniture. It would become the Italy, the not little Italy. It would become an Italian commerce center. And that would work, because then we could have the piazza. It would be exactly what we want. But you, you can't shoehorn it into 43,000 square feet in the middle of Market Street. And you certainly can't make it a big box store in Mountain View. We are not a place where you drive to a Walmart-looking facility and, and live. You need to be able to go to our place on a bicycle. You need to be able to walk to our places. That's what they're about. They're about being mm -hmm. integrated into the urban experience. It is not a drive-to place. So 
You let San Francisco know I'm waiting. <laughs> I will. I'm from San Francisco. There you go. I lived there for five years. I love the town. It would be perfect for us. We would be perfect for it. And there's one place I want. Okay. Well, we'll work on it. Um, and then um, one other question. If you could tell us a little bit about the inspiration for your new book, since you're all about Italian cooking, and now you're, you just did the Big American Cookbook. The Big American Cookbook is inspired by, as I travel around shucking and jiving my Italian culture, I, of course, I've always been in love with American food and culture. And as you travel around, you realize that there's a vaster, more complicated web of deliciousness and a much more regional immigrant story that is all around America. Nothing outside of the Native American Indian culture had anything originally here. So as groups of people came and started telling their story, whether it was Eastern European immigrants to kind of the northern Midwest, Minnesota, Detroit, Michigan area, Ohio, and brought their kind of deli culture there, or whether it was you know, the Cajun culture from either the mix of French and Caribbean and Western African that became New Orleans, or the Latin American culture coming up becoming part of the Southwest along with cowboys and the people that kind of moved out that way. Each one of what I decided in this book right here were kind of eight regions, and their own songs were sung by the people that lived there, whether they recognized how they got there because they were seventh-generation Swedes and didn't even really even practice Swedish culture, but they knew their name and they knew their dishes, and they were fundamentally more American than people that have, you know, didn't have any American, I mean, and didn't remember any of their you know, national roots. So I discovered all of these dishes, and I would go to town to town, and I would have a book tour, a book sign, and I'd say, hello, hey, what's going on? Where's the best thing to eat? And they'd all direct me to the fanciest restaurant, and I would probably go there because that was my job. But more interestingly to, to me, it was the next day, maybe I'm on my way out of town or I'm going somewhere, and I wanted to taste something that told me the way the wind smelled on a Thursday afternoon when it blew through town when it was just finished raining. And if I could capture that smell, that flavor of that town, that was the dishes that made it into this book. So as opposed to saying, what's your favorite dish? I would say, if you moved away from this town for a year and came back, what's the first thing you eat? And who makes it? And can I meet them? And can I eat it too? And those are the, these are the recipes. So I didn't write that. I never got anybody to give me a written recipe. They gave me a, 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 an audible and I wrote it down, and then I practiced it, and I tasted it, and see if it worked. And every now and then, if there was an odd discrepancy, I would call the local food writer of the local Wednesday column and say, I'm kind of making this pasty from you know the miners of Cornwall, and I'm trying to figure out why it doesn't taste good. They said, well, you put too much meat in it. They were poor. They had potatoes, and there was a little bit of meat in it. Oh, that makes sense. I got you now. And maybe the crust was supposed to be lard, and I went butter, and it was back to lard that made a lot of sense. So it was a fascinating interchange and a really great lesson on the riches of uh, the American ingenuity. Fantastic. I mean, I'm a big fan of this book, obviously. Awesome. I love the idea of the local food writer suddenly getting the call from Mario Batali right. asking, uh, you know. Hey, what about that pasty I had over there? In the, the, I had one at the gas station, and it was really good. I'm like, well, she passed away, but let me see if I can find a recipe. You know, and I was like, all right. That's great. Yes. Hi, I'm Donna. Hi, Donna. Um, my husband and I are huge foodies, so I'm like really excited right now. Um, me too. <laughs> great. Glad we're equally excited. Um, so with a lot of the major food trends sort of evolving from molecular gastronomy to now like food sort of being transformational at places like Alenia, where do you sort of see food trends evolving in the next few years? Well, that is a good question. I'll tell you where it is. I think, I think what's going to happen is the rich people are going to eat the rich people's food and everyone else is not. <laughs> And what I will suggest is that we might be looking at a violent revolution in 25 years in America based almost exclusively on access to good food. And that shouldn't diminish anyone's passion or excitement. <laughs> but I would say that as these remarkable experiences, like Alinea, which is perhaps my greatest restaurant experience in my life, I went there with my son Benno four years ago, and when we were walking out, he said, Dad, I don't think I can ever think about food the same way again, because it's a mindfuck of amazing deliciousness and thought and provocative and stuff. I, I love that, that full-on experience, but the price tag, I mean, you know, the Noma in, in Tulum, which is this week for the next six weeks, is 600 bucks after you have to get there. And it's just, a, you know, there, there's no question if you have 600 bucks, it's worth that. It's like, you know, is it worth 
Spike Lee spending 250 grand a year for two tickets on the floor at the garden to watch the Knicks suck? Or is it, <laughs> or is it better to spend $600 at dinner three or four times a month and have a great time for the entire year and save 100 grand? Like, so, I mean, the value is a difficult issue. It's a question of whether you're celebrating regional and nuance and variation or whether you're celebrating the true Michelangelos of our time. And what we have to do as consumers is find a way to hopefully support all the levels. But what you will find is that you generally end up supporting the ones that give you what you perceive to be the best value in a consistent experience in the price point that you want. So I love all of them. But for me, my favorite meals are generally at the trattoria and osteria level or the taqueria level than the kind of high-end, mid-range, super fancy experiences because I live there. So like, I'm just as happy to sit down in a table outside with my shoes off, feet in the sand, and eat freshly caught linguine with clams than to spend a lot of time where 14 people touch my linguine with chopsticks and put it down in lines like that and, <laughs> and charge me 40 bucks or 50 bucks for the same plate effectively. So I don't know if I answered your question, but I think that there is a huge variation of really cool things going on. And as much as we can, we should support all of the artists whose work we can afford. So visit Massimo in Italy is what you said. I'm having dinner with him tomorrow night. He's in town all week supporting the Wasted movie that they did with ZPZ that comes out this week. Next week, we will be in Los Angeles with, um, what's his name, Pam? My favorite journalist in Los Angeles? Oh, uh, Gold? Uh, Jonathan Gold. Jonathan Gold and Maximo and I and Dominic Kren, Dominique Kren oh. and Mary Sue Milliken are all going to talk about the idea of what wasted food is mm. and how we can hopefully get ahead of it before it gets ahead of us. Mark, we have to wrap this up. But before right, we do, it. no, 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 I can't, I can't let, you, let it go. You, you slipped something in there on that last question about a violent revolution. I don't know if you remember this part. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> so let's not, uh, we, I don't think we can let that, uh, let that pass. Or do, or do you really have a, uh, the, that kind of a bleak view of what's coming think, in the next I couple don't decades? Think, I don't think violent revolution is necessarily so bleak. Oh, really? I think that if the uber wealthy, if you look at the new tax codes, mm -hmm. just rewarding the rich for being rich is a very short-term vision for what should be happening in the richest country of all time. There should be a ubiquity of education, of access to food and resources that should not be stolen or misappropriated by the 1 to 10, 20, 40%. They should be shared. It should be a much more common investment. We shouldn't look at hunger relief or education as charity. It should be looked at as an investment for us to become a stronger nation from which we can share all of the resources that we have to make everyone better and share that internationally, not just make the rich here a little richer. And I look at the cabinet choices and I see people that are not fit to be in charge and not fit to make decisions, in my opinion. And they are making them from a greedy spot. And greed is, we don't have time for it. And as we look at torturing our planet, beating the carbon out of it, and looking at the way that these people are going to manage what we consider to be the big things that we should all be sharing, I don't see violence as out of line. Hmm. Do you have a bunker somewhere? Or you I have a bunker. I have a house in northern Michigan. No one even knows where it is. You can come up with me, and when we run out of water, 22% of the world's water is in the, in the Great Lakes in, 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 in America. Well, Mario, you were fascinating. We were fascinated. Thank you very much Fantastic. for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thank you.